All right, so on day one of the class, I mentioned this course takes seven hours uh, per week outside of lecture and lab. Uh, at a minimum, I think some of you are starting to believe me, some of you are coming around to that, that fact. Uh, and we're still getting ramped up. We still haven't really gotten into these first homework assignments unless you started those ones. So, uh, just a note, just a few notes on that. Uh, last week, uh, especially Friday, we covered a lot of content all in one lecture. And uh, if you didn't get it all in that lecture, I mean, of course, that's part of the seven hours a week outside of lab and, lab and lectures to study that material. Uh, please visit the um, please visit the videos. All the lectures are recorded. We watch the lectures. Office hours. Chat with us. Ask us questions. Come to the review sessions. We have a review session today after class, four to six. Tomorrow, four to six. Friday, four to six. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities for you to get extra help and get your questions answered. Also, Piazza, post your questions on Piazza. And just a recommendation, it's a lot better if you go to Piazza and say, hey, or office hours, review session, wherever, and say, hey, uh, you talked about constructors in lecture, and I just, I don't know what constructors are. Can you explain that to me? Those are much better questions than... Uh, what we seem to get in droves and hundreds, uh, hundreds of questions per week of, I get this error when I do the lecture question, fix it. But like, how do I fix this? Uh, we can get you through that lecture question, but that doesn't really help you in the long run. But if there's something you're fundamentally misunderstanding about the concepts, if we can fix that and, and get you understanding that, then it's going to be a lot easier for you moving forward. Uh, so just some recommendations. We get tons of questions of just help me with this particular problem, which by the way, is the reason for lecture questions. If I don't have lecture questions, those students just don't do anything. Uh, I don't want to make lecture questions for every lecture. It's a lot of work for me, um, but I have to to get you pushing along, pushing you and getting you staying up with the material. Anyway, I don't want to get on too long of a tangent with that, but just a, a reminder, yeah, you're, you're feeling it. I did say this day one. This course is tough. It's going to take a lot of work. Uh, any general questions about the course or anything before we get into some new content? Yes. Uh, yeah. So the, there really is no such thing as credit for the lecture question. So just to twist your question a little bit here. So if you hand in the lecture question late, that's infinitely better than you not submitting it at all and not, not completing it at all. So when I review your lecture, your learning objective, I'll see, oh, okay, there were a few lecture questions you submitted late, but you got the rest on time, and you did eventually get each one. I mean, at that point, what am I going to say? Well, you didn't complete the learning objective. You, you don't know how to write a unit test because you wrote them a day late. Like, that doesn't make sense. So if you didn't mark them late, you know, I'll see that during the review process and take that into consideration. If you just, deadline passes and you just flat out don't go back to it, you know, that's another thing. That's, that's infinitely better to do them late than not do them at all. Uh, and... Uh, I meant to mention this in each lecture. I think this is the one I remembered to mention it in on Friday. But when you, when a deadline passes, go into your gradebook and click on that assignment, and you can still submit there. The button will say submit late, but you can still submit and get that lecture question in. So just because it disappears from the home page of the course doesn't mean you can't access them. Uh, you just have to go through the gradebook to get those past assignments. The assignments have already, passed, and you can still submit them. Yeah, just a, a reminder on that. Your goal is to, to show me that you can do those three bullet points. Can you, uh, given some functionality of a method, can you write proper unit tests that are comprehensive, that can test everything, not just test enough to get through Autolab and have Autolab give a bunch of smiley faces, uh, but can you really test your code? Can you, uh, do you understand how methods work when they're using references, when they're passed by reference? which we'll touch on towards the end of today's lecture and a lot more the rest of the week. Uh, and can you map out the stack and heap memory of a program execution? Can you trace through the execution? Uh, nowhere in there does it say, did you hand in the lecture questions on time or, or anything like that. Like, I, I just need to know. Show me that you can do those three things. That's what I'm ultimately looking for. And the lecture questions are one of the ways that I'm giving you, hey, here's one very simple, straightforward way that you can show me that you can do those things. Question? Yeah. Also, like, uh, let's say when you look at the auto lab submissions, right? I mean, I'm like multiple, but they're like over a billion minutes. Is that like a super bad thing? Cool. 
if you have like four submissions that are close, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll see how that. That's fine. Uh, four, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think a thing of it. Uh, there are students who have hundreds for lecture questions. Even those are the ones that I that are going to raise red flags for me. If you're over like twenty, I would say just spitball. Um, that's where it starts being concerned because at that point, did you do you really know how to write your unit tests to test your functionality? Pecking away at the keyboard, submitting it to AutoLab, and seeing what my grader coughs up. Uh, you don't know how to test unit tests at that point. Four, I wouldn't think a thing about. Four, you, know, you might add some syntax, you know, some typos. You might have capital letters where they should be lowercase and things like that. Uh, uh, like for the last lecture question, there was some confusion because there was the counter class that you create with a capital V, and then to instantiate that class when you create an object of that type, you would start in a variable. And variable name should start with a lowercase v. So when I called the method in one of my examples, I had a lowercase v vote counter. That would be my variable name. And then some students got mixed up and thought that should be the class name uh, and that uh, with the lowercase v. So things like that. I mean, that can eat up four submissions easy. Just, uh, just getting those things straight. But uh, um, I wouldn't think a thing of four submissions. Even 10 or so. I wouldn't think a thing of it. But yeah. 50 or something like that, you don't know how to do unit testing at that point. Sorry to say, you just don't. You don't know how to, you don't understand the unit testing at that point. <clears throat> right, any other questions? All right. So we, we learned classes and objects. Lecture content has to move forward. Uh, lecture moves relentlessly forward in this class. There's a lot of content to get through in one semester. Uh, we, we will show examples of classes and objects. I'll try to reinforce that whenever I have an opportunity, when I can show an example that uses classes. There will be one at the end of today's lecture. Uh, but we got to move on from that concept. So if you have questions, please, office hours, piazza, review sessions. We have a lot of other opportunities outside of lecture for you to get that content. And of course, watching the lectures. Without further ado, let's get into today's stuff. So the lecture question today will be objects and classes. I am reinforcing that here with emphasis on references. So for this one, create a class named team that's going to represent a, a sports team with integer values for the strength of its offense and defense, and also a score initialized to zero that's going to be the, the score that they have after or during the game. So we want to represent all this in one class. And then have a referee object with two methods that are going to work with references of type team. So a referee is going to have a play game method that's going to take two teams by reference, check their offense and defense, and compute their score. We're going to have a very simple style of game. We take their offense minus the other team's defense, and that's that team's score for that game. Except scores can't be negative, so we have one edge case here. You can't have negative scores. So if the other team's defense is greater than that team's offense, uh, greater than or equal, they just get a zero for that score. And then another method, declare winner, that's going to take two teams again. And this time it's going to return the team a higher score. So the referee is going to officiate a game. You're going to get two teams, officiate the game, determine the scores of each team, and then declare winner after you set those score state variables Take, read those score state variables and figure out who won this game and return a reference to that team. So you'll have a method that takes two parameters of the team of this type that you created and also return an instance of type team. With one edge case here, if there's a tie, return a new object with score uh, with offense and defense both set to zero. And one thing I want to point out, I saw this trip up uh, quite a few students for Friday's question. If anything, and this is true in general, any lecture question, any homework, any lab, um, anything that's going to be submitted to AutoLab at least, I'll say, if there's functionality that's not explicitly defined in the problem statement, do not add that to your testing. So what I mean is here, a team's offense and defense is given as parameters in its constructor. Okay, we have some defined behavior. This constructor takes two ints but I never defined what those variables should be named. So if you say new team, uh, uh, new team one, or uh, fail team one of type team equals new team of six offense and three defense, and your next line in your testing is assert 
uh, team one dot offense equals six. Once you do dot offense, that's not defined here. So that will be fine on your testing. You named your variable offense, so dot offense, that's going to work fine. But when you submit a test is being ran against my correct and incorrect solutions, well, you're really rolling the dice on that one, just hoping that I also name my variable offense. If I didn't also name that variable offense, you're going to get an error. That variable doesn't exist. Can't find variable offense. And you're just going to get the, uh, the uh, errors in Autolab. It's just going to say error when running a correct solution, error when running an incorrect solution. You're going to get all those errors. Even though it's fine on yours, well, you used a variable name in some definite sense, not defined in the question. So it's just hoping that I just happen to name my variables the same thing. Maybe sometimes you get lucky. I probably named them offense and defense on this one. But what if I named them team offense and team defense? Now you got errors in your test. So something to be cautious of, if it's not defined here, you're just guessing that I named them the same thing. I saw that quite a bit on Friday's lecture question. I want to shine a light on that one. Make sure we get, uh, get past that. If it's not defined in the question, you can't test it in your testing. And it's true in general, in the industry too. If somebody's writing a method and you're testing something that you specifically find that they didn't, those tests are broken. All right, so with that, let's talk about how programs execute. So last semester in 116, you used interpreted languages, Python, JavaScript. What this means is when you run your code in an interpreted language, you're running a program called an interpreter, and that's reading your code line by line reads line one, runs line one, reads line two, runs line two, and just line by line runs your code. Contrast that to compiled languages like Scala, uh, which you probably noticed some differences, differences in behavior with Scala. Part of it's going to be due to this. Scala is a compiled language, which means before you can run your program, your entire code, your entire project, everything is translated into another language, and then that language is executed. So we're not actually just running line by line. We're compiling into another language and then running that compiled code <laughs> line by line. So let me highlight one of the, the differences here, one of the, the differences that you've most likely seen uh, through your experience so far. Uh, first, just a quick detour. I won't get hung up on the syntax too long, but I wanted to show an example of classes in Python. So this is a class definition in Python. To define the instructor, we use this specifically named underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. First parameter always being self, which is the same as this in Scala. It's a reference to the calling object. Then the parameter list for the constructor. And then if we want to define state variables, anywhere in this code we can do self.state, typically in the constructor, it should be in the constructor. Self.state to define a state variable. Then we have access or whatever variable name you want. Then you can access that variable in methods, but you define those in the constructor. So a little bit different syntax. We also don't use the keyword new in Python. They just, I don't know, Python doesn't want to use the keyword new. It's fine. We'll let them do that. So let's look at this program. It's going to create a new object of type runtime error example with the input of five. So five is going to be that initial state, which is assigned to the state variable name state. We're going to call this add to state method of with 10, going to print adding to state, add that 10 to the 5, so state is now 15, then print out 15 to the screen. So we run this program, add it to state, print it to the screen, and we have 15 printed to the screen. Now since this is an interpreted language, this will be ran one line at a time. So if we look at our other example, this line is going to run, create our object, initialize it, that state variable to 5, this line is going to run, calling add to state with the string ten. That goes to to add. We're going to print out adding to state. This line does get executed. You run this code, you will get that line printed to the screen. And then self dot state, which is an int of uh, of type int with a value five. We're going to add to that the string ten ten. And right here, we're going to get a what we call a runtime error. While our program was running, we ran into an error. We're trying to add incompatible types. Adding an int and a string error right at this line, our program crashes. But importantly, our program does run, but it crashes 
when it, well it's running. So this, this can be a scary error. Uh, sometimes your IDEs can, uh, can find things like this and, and help you out. I don't think this one is gonna find, uh, I believe. Um, but we have a bug in our program that's kind of hard to find in many cases. And you can imagine this in hundreds of lines of code. You have one error of this style, uh, one of these incompatible types errors. Tough to find in an interpreted language. language. So let's look at the same example in Scala. For example, Scala, Java, C, C++, and many, many others are compiled languages, which means our code will be translated to another language, and then that code is executed. Our code is never actually ran directly by these compiled languages. We don't get that line by line, run this line, run this line behavior. Effectively, we do. If you just want to close your eyes and forget about it, it kind of feels like that. That's what's going to happen. But it's actually being compiled first. When you hit that green go button in IntelliJ, it compiles. You get that progress bar on the bottom, and it seems like it takes forever to run your program. That's the compilation. And then it runs after that compilation. So that's what takes forever when you click run in Scala. It has to compile first. So this example, we're going to create a new object of our type compiler error. Add 10 to that instance variable. Everything's fine. Everything works the way we expect it to. But now when we introduce that same error, add to state of 10, this is going to give us what we call a compiler error. So when the compiler is doing that translation into the other language, it's doing a lot of checks for us. It's checking all of our syntax. It's checking all of our types, importantly, for this example. And, it's, and when it gets to this part of this program, it's going to say, hey, you have a string that you're using as an argument. This method takes an int. You can't do that. The compiler's going to yell at you, and it's going to give you what's called a compiler error. And, you're, and it's never going to run your code at all. Because it never gets through the phase, that compilation phase, where it's translating your code into code in a different language. So you never get to the point where you can run. So with this, I, I don't have my print statement, but if I have my print statements in here, even if it was the first line of the main method, that would not be printed to the screen, because your code is never able to run. It never gets a chance to run. Now, this is often a good thing. I mean, you, you can have split opinions on it. I'm of the, I'm of the camp that compilers are good things. The compiler is finding a lot of errors for us. It might be tougher to run a compiled program because you have to get all your <coughs> bugs of this nature out of the way before you can even run. But the compiler is searching for all of that stuff for you. Whereas on the last example with Python, it's up to us to find that bug. We got to find those bugs. We have to do extensive testing to figure out what, uh, what can go wrong or else our programs are going to crash. We're going to release this code to the users. They're going to do something we didn't anticipate program crashes, we have mad customers. With compiled languages, we can still get runtime errors, don't get me wrong, but the compiler is going to look for a lot of them and make sure that at least all of our types are going to be correct, all of our syntax is going to be correct, it's going to look for a lot of things that an interpreted language can't look for because the interpreted language doesn't find those errors until it, it's running that code. So the compiler is going to do a lot of checks for us like this. So we'll get more compiler errors but fewer runtime Runtime errors are so much scarier uh, that it's easy to get runtime errors in production out there to the users. Com uh, compilers also kind of fix a lot of our code for us. And what I mean by that is it will optimize wherever it can. Wherever it sees us doing something a little silly, a little wasteful, it will fix that for us and uh, do things in a more optimal way. Modern compilers are, are really advanced, they're really sophisticated be able to find a lot of things. Uh, so one example, just one quick example of that. This is a program that should crash. In Scala, it won't. This actually won't crash. So this is what we call an infinite recursion. We have, we're calling this recursive function with a value. This recursive function just calls itself and that's it. So this function is going to end up creating an infinite number of variables named n, each one requiring 32 bits. Eventually, you're going to lose all the memory on your machine, and you're going to crash. The program will no longer be able to create a new, another variable n. It's going to crash. So what we call a stack overflow, the namesake of our favorite website. So this code should crash, but the compiler, the Scala compiler, will actually fix this for us and uh, kind of 
turn this into an infinite loop instead of infinite recursion without creating new variables. And if you're interested in more of that, this is called tail recursion. It's a topic we'll, we'll talk about later when we get to that functional programming. Um, but just one example that a compiler will fix certain things that can go very wrong. It'll actually help us out quite a bit and optimize uh, quite a bit as well. So one of the big advantages of compilers is we can write kind of crappy code and the compiler will optimize the, the uh, will optimize it quite a bit for us, make it a lot faster. Scala specifically compiles into a language called Java bytecode. And this is the same language that Java code is compiled to. Compiled Scala code and compiled Java code is for all intents and purposes the same. It's the same language. They're purely compatible. And Scala, compiled Scala Java is installed. It runs on something called the Java Virtual Machine, and the Java Virtual Machine is going to take Java bytecode and run it as an interpretive language. So Scala and Java, they're kind of these hybrid languages where they're compiled to Java bytecode, and then Java bytecode is interpreted. So they're compiled and interpreted when you, when you look at the details of it. Uh, the JVM, if you've ever seen these windows that says update your Java, that's your JVM. If you've ever seen one of these screens, on one of your devices, that device has Java installed, which is like most devices, most uh, all major operating systems, Android phones, uh, toasters, I don't know, a lot, of, a lot of appliances actually run on Java. I don't exactly know why, but, um, but billions of devices, that's not an exaggeration, it's literally billions <coughs> of devices. I think one of these says, sometimes they'll say that on the splash screen, installed on you know, three point whatever billion, whatever the number is now. It's everywhere. So when we run, when we build our Scala programs, they can run pretty ubiquitous. They can run on a lot of different devices. This also implies that Scala is interchangeable with Java. We can have programs that mix both Java and Scala. They both compile to the same thing. They can be used in conjunction in our programs. And we saw this when I opened up the string class. And uh, the first thing it just said, Scala string equals the Java string. We're not going to do anything to define a string in Scala. We're just going to use the Java string. So when we run a program, if you've ever used a string in a Scala program, you all have by now, we're using Java bytecode that was compiled from Java code at that point. And we'll use this. We use some libraries, specifically Java FX. We're going to use Java libraries in this course and just mix these languages at our leisure. Like we, can, we can mix them as much as we want. Uh, because it's all Java bytecode at the time that it's ran. All right, any questions on that? A quick overview on interpolation versus compilation. All right, let's talk about memory. <laughs> this is what we'll talk about for um, the majority of the rest of this week. So let's talk about memory. So all of our values, so when we run a program, what we want to answer, what we want to ask is, where are values stored? How are they stored? What implications, most importantly, what implications do, does that have to us as developers? When we're writing our programs, why should we even care where this stuff is stored in memory? So all of our program memory is stored in RAM on these random sticks. And these are effectively giant arrays. You have indexed memory addresses. You can get the value at any memory address by its index. You can say, give me the value at index, uh, at memory address, whatever, and your RAM is going to give you that value. Uh, it's what we call random access. It's basically a giant array. How an array, you can say, give me the value at index 3 or whatever. RAM is the same way, just a much, much larger array. So even when we have our uh, other data structures that we work with, Technically, they're all implemented on a giant array. Arrays, when you really look at it, is really the only data structure we have because that's what our RAM is. It's just one big array, and then we simulate other data structures within that array. RAM is much, much faster than hard drive. Well, programs will only use the hard drive when it's or when that's a feature of the program. If your program saves files to the hard disk, you know, that's, uh, uh, we'll use that. And the hard drive is the only thing that persists. If you want 
data that lives longer than the execution of your program will see that all your program memory is free and is deleted after your program ends. If you want that memory to stay, you gotta save it to a file, save it to your hard drive, uh, and use that. RAM is much, much faster than the hard drive, though. Those of you doing rhyming dictionary, you'll, if you make a mistake on that homework, a very particular one, uh, which I give a warning about in the assignment, if you open that dictionary file and iterate over the entire file 122,000 times, which is the number of words in the dictionary, if you have a loop that that's what it's doing for every single word, read the whole file, you're going to time out in Autolab, and when you run on your laptop, it's going to take forever. It's going to take a very long time. Those are very expensive operations to be able to, to go to this and read from this hard disk. Even if you have an SSD, it's going to take a long time. But doing the same operations and reading that many times from RAM, not a big deal. It's just a lot, lot faster. Much, much, much faster. And that's why RAM, 16 gigs of RAM, can cost us more than a terabyte hard drive. We're paying for that speed. We're paying for that optimization. So when we start a program, what, our, what we're going to do, or what the JVM does for us, is talks to our operating system and says, hey, I'm about to run a program. Give me a slice of that RAM stick. And it's going to give us some small portion of that RAM stick and say, OK, these are the memory addresses that you're allowed to use for this program. And that's what we're going to be confined in before and after those, that block of memory addresses that we get. Might be used by other programs. It might not, but the operating system isn't going to let us escape those bounds anyway because it might want to give that memory to another program. But we get a chunk of continuous memory that we're going to use for our program. And what the JVM is going to do is store some meta information about our program somewhere in this memory range. It's a bit outside of the scope of 116, but the, other than that, this memory is going to be used for what we call the program stack or the memory stack. And we're going to use this space in a last in, first out manner. So we're going to start at the top of that memory range, at the lowest memory address, the lowest value memory address, and then add values uh, in consecutive order. We're going to have one continuous block of memory storing all the variables and values for our program. And, and if we ever want to remove a value from the stack, we have to remove the last one that we added. Whatever's on the bottom of that stack, that's the one, only one we can remove, and we can only add to the bottom of that stack. A few bit of definitions. We'll, go, we'll walk through an example of all this, but I want to get the definitions out there before we get into it too much. Uh, a stack frame. Whenever a method is called, in our program, it's going to create what we call a new stack frame. And this stack frame is basically an entirely separate uh, uh, execution area. I'm lacking my word there. Uh, but the stack frame is going to be like an isolated environment. That's what it was. An isolated environment where that method is going to execute. Our programs are going to start in the main method stack frame and have this isolated environment that can't see any that's going on in memory. And then each time we call a method, we'll create another stack frame, which will be another separate portion of the stack that can't access anything outside of that area on the stack. We also have scope. Whenever we hit a new code block, different rules are going to apply to that block. It's not quite as intense as a stack frame, as in when you're inside a code block, you can still see values on the stack that are outside of that code block, but this is where our scoping rules come in. What variables can you see? What variables can't you see? And if you have two variables of the same name, which one is used? And we'll see that the, the one that's used is going to be the one in the innermost code block that's executing. Oh, and, and when we hit the end of a code block, any variables that were defined inside that block are destroyed. So when, if we have a loop, we say for i in range of 0 to 10, and we iterate that loop's done, hits the end of that loop block, we don't have access to that variable i anymore. Our iteration variable that was created as part of that loop, as part of that block, so that variable is destroyed. After that loop runs, we can't say print i. It doesn't exist anymore. The variable is gone. 
So let's run through this program. This program we're going to compute the factorial, uh, we're going to compute five factorial, give this five, iterate from one to n inclusive, and multiply one through n inclusive to itself starting at one, multiply those all together, and we should get five factorial. Uh, so before we step through this example, are there any questions on what we just talked about? It's probably the worst time for questions because you want to see the example so the last few slides make more sense. But anybody have a question? Okay. So let's step through this program one line at a time and see what happens in memory as this program is executing. So the very first thing that gets put on the stack, we always do the stack from the top down. These are memory addresses in an array with the lower indices at the top, higher indices at the bottom. So we're going to have our stack go down. It's kind of the opposite of what you would think of as a stack. Like if you had a stack of papers and you're, you're adding and removing from the top of that stack, we're doing the same thing except the whole stack's upside down. We're adding and removing only from the bottom of the stack. So the first thing, the command line arguments, again, we won't use these in this class, um, but, uh, but this is where if you were calling your program from the command line and had some extra arguments in that command line call, this is where those command line arguments would be stored. It would be the very first thing <coughs> on the stack, it would be those command line arguments as the main function in this case is executed. I forgot to mention on the previous slide, but if this code it's meant to be language independent, and I'll use functions instead of methods here. Uh, this code happens to run as JavaScript code. Just by the way, I happen to write my code. I wasn't intending to hit any particular language. I just wanted to get some general syntax out there so we can focus on what's happening in memory. All right, so command line arguments go on the stack. And we're going to create our first variable. We'll declare a variable named i. It's not necessarily good JavaScript code because I don't have any lots or consts or even bars in here. Everything's a global variable. But uh, regardless, uh, so I'm going to create my first variable i. I'm going to say, give me a variable named i and assign it the value 5. So my program is going to read this line and say, I can do that. I have space on the stack. I'm going to put that variable on the stack. Now on the stack, I have a variable named i, value 5. And it's the first variable that was declared goes right after our command line arguments on the stack. We're going to look at the next line. Get our first function call. We're going to call compute factorial. So we're going to begin a brand new stack frame. We're no longer in the stack frame of the main method, that top level stack frame. We're going to start a brand new frame. And we're going to create a variable for our, each parameter, just one in this case, and assign it the value of the arguments. So we created a brand new variable named n, assigned it the value 5, which is what the expression i resolved to, and put that inside this brand new stack frame that we created. So we have a new stack frame, and we put that new variable in there, <coughs> and we'll create a variable for each parameter that's going to be in that stack frame. Next line, a variable named result, and assigning it the value 1. So that's the next thing, next open spot on my stack. I'm going to put that new variable result equals 1. And I hit my next block of code. So now I have a for loop. And I'm going to begin the block for that loop. And I'm going to take the initialization variable, my iteration variable, and put that inside that block on the stack. So I have this variable named i, assign it the value 1. I'm going to put that inside the loop block on the stack. Then, i got to skip that one. Uh, I mean, I guess. It's multiplying one by one on this thing. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, I do want to skip that one because that's not too interesting. It's not much to talk about now. So once we get to the end of the first iteration of our for loop, uh, we're going to increment i by 1. This executes at the end of each iteration. So I'm going to go to i, and I'm going to increment that by 1. Now notice I do have another variable named i outside of that stack frame. 
but my code can't see that variable, can't access that variable i. So when I say I have two i's on the stack, but my program knows I mean this one because that's the only one it can see right now. Now we're going to get to the body. We're going to execute the body of this for loop again. I is two. Result, I'm accessing a variable named result and multiplying it by two. But inside this loop block, my program is going to look for a variable named result. It's not going to find it. Once it doesn't find a variable named result, it's going to expand its search to outside of that block. And once it's outside of that block, it will find a variable named result. And that's the one it's going to use. It's going to say, hey, I have a variable named result. I have a variable named i. And it's going to use those variables for this expression. Now I have result multiplied by 2. I increments. I'm going to go through the rest of this loop. Uh, not going to go through every iteration of this loop. But once every iteration of that loop is done, result is going to have the value 120. I is going to have the value 5. I reach the end of the for loop. I check my condition one more time. The condition is going to be false on the, uh, it should be i equals 6. Uh, but once i equals 6, this condition is going to be false, and I reach the end of my for loop. So I reach the end of a code block, which means everything that was defined within that code block is going to be destroyed. We're going to remove it all from the stack, and that entire loop, that variable i, that block of code, all of that's gone. So we start just deleting things off the stack until we reach the beginning of that for loop, that block of code. And all that information is gone. Next thing we reach is the return statement. So we're going to return this value 120. And once we return that, we're going to do the same thing we just did with that code block we're going to do to this entire stack frame. We're going to destroy this entire stack frame because we've reached our return value. We're done with all this. The function call is just going to resolve to that return value. And I can return 120, destroy everything else in that stack. Any variable that was called, that, that was created during that function call, including the parameters, gone. Completely gone. They're off the stack. Don't exist anymore. So we're going to return 120, create a new variable n in the main stack frame. At 120, then print it to the screen. Now we reach the end of our main stack frame, the end of our program. And once we reach that, JVM is going to go to the our OS, say, hey, we're, that memory we asked for, we're done with it, give it back to the operating system, free up all that memory, and everything's gone from our program. The program doesn't exist on our RAM anymore. All the values from it are gone. So let's look at this example and make a few changes and see what implications different changes could, could have. The first thing I want to do Oh wait, let me run this first. Let's just uh, just verify that it's doing what I claim it's going to do. And we're going to return 120. And prints 120, returns 120. Now what if type. But what if I create a variable named result in here? Now generally the big we're going to talk about scoping. The biggest, easiest way to prevent any issues with this, just don't reuse variable names. But what if we did reuse a variable name? How does our program handle that? Well, first, we didn't get an error. You, uh, we might expect to get an error there. We have two variables of the same name. How's our program going to handle that? But since these variables are defined in different scopes, in different blocks, this is actually allowed. These are two completely different variables. This is the variable result associated with this block. This is the variable result associated with this block or the stack frame that's created when that function or method in this case, when this method is called. So these are two different variables. 
when we run this, when we reach this line, even my IDE is telling me, when we reach this line, our program's gonna search within this scope, within this block for a variable named result. That variable named result is going to be within code block on the stack. So it's going to find this variable named result and then stop at search. Why would it look any further? It's already got a variable named result. It doesn't have to expand its search and in fact it won't expand its search to this. So this loop is modifying this result. End of the block. This result is destroyed. Here the only result left is this one which was initialized to one and then never touched. So we actually returned one from this program because we reuse that variable name. If we do the same thing, but we create variable here, now we have two variables named result in the same code block. This is not allowed. This We get all kinds of errors. It says result can't be resolved. It just doesn't know what to do. Scala doesn't know what to do with that. It's not something we would ever want to do. Uh, should never do that one. But what if, what if we name this i? Now we have three different is named i in our program, but this actually doesn't affect our functionality. Or don't take it from me, let's see it. So now, when we hit this line, our program's going to look for a variable named i, finds it within this code block, this iteration variable we, we're using for our for loop, finds i, and doesn't search, never finds this one because it already stopped its search, found it, never has to look outside of that code block, so it's not going to. It's only going to look outside of that if it doesn't find the variable with the name that we were given, that we have. But we can't go outside of the block. So even though at this point we will have a variable named i on the stack, if I change this to another name, we will have a variable named i on the stack. It was created in the method, but it's outside of the stack frame. We're not allowed to access anything outside of the current stack frame, so we can't see that variable i. And that, that's a very important fact that allows recursion to happen. If you have two calls to a recursive method on the stack, which you should, that's a point of recursion is to have multiple calls on the stack. But uh, each call, the parameter variables defined in that method are going to have the same names. So we have to have some way to be able to handle this. Um, and for stack frames, the answer is just don't let people access outside of their stack frame. And for scoping, start within the innermost scope and then expand your search outward. Any questions while I have the code up and can see examples? So, so that's stack memory. Stack memory is where all the values are stored of any what we call primitive type. This includes double, float, int, long, short, char, byte, and boolean. And that's it. Everything else goes on what's called the program heap, or the memory heap. Everything else goes on the heap. Yeah, there are always exceptions to everything. Whenever I say everything and all and all that stuff, there's always exceptions. But for our purposes, these are the only values that will go on the heap. Notably missing from this list is string. <laughs> Strings don't even go on the stack. These are the types that have Java primitives. They all have fixed number of bits for the representations. So when you put a variable of this type on of any of these types on the stack, you know exactly how many bits to allocate for that value. That's not true for any other types. Uh, uh, I mean, it can be, um, but it's not necessarily true for any other types. Especially strings. strings are going to be um, variable length by nature. So we don't know how much memory to allocate for the stack. It would really jam up our stack if we had values like that on the stack. So all the anything else, including every single class you define, is going to go on 
any object you create with a, through a class you define, or just an object you create, it's all going on the heat. So what is the heat? We'll have a quick example today. I might go, I'll go through it pretty quick. I might go through this example a little slower next time, but I do have more, uh, more complex examples for Wednesday that we'll go through. So what is the heap? The heap is where we're going to store our more dynamic memory. So if I have a value, I should remove those slides. I want to jump right to this one. Where if I have a value that I want to be more dynamic, I don't know how many bytes it's going to take, I don't know uh, much about it, I'm going to put that on the heap. And well, it has to be on the heap. So if I have this class that just has some variable, one variable, an int, I'm going to, and I create a new one, when I create a new instance of this class, it's going to go on the heap, which means our program or the JVM went to the operating system and said, hey, I know you gave me that memory for the It's really nice. I like it. I'm happy with it. But my user's creating this object. I need some more memory for it. The operating system is going to say, no problem. And it's going to give us some memory somewhere in RAM. We don't know where. We don't really care where. But it's going to allocate us enough memory that we asked for to store our object. And it's going to give us a reference to that memory address. And that's all we work with. When we, have, when we use the keyword new, new is going to return a reference which tells us how to find that memory address where that memory was allocated and where we stored that object we created. So new is going to create this object on the heap somewhere, just at some random memory address. I just picked a random number for this. And then return the reference. And the reference is what's stored in the variable on the stack. So I have a variable named data, which stores a reference to the memory address where my object was created. Now when I call a method that my object as a parameter, I'm not the whole object. I know I said that on Friday. I wanted to make it a little simpler for Friday. Uh, it's not necessarily given the whole object, and it's not making a copy of the object and sending a copy to that method, to that new stack frame that's being created. A new stack frame is being created, and we're giving it the parameter, the argument, which is the reference to the object that I created. So I'm passing the reference to that, uh, to that method, or function in this case, to that function. And now when this method, function, eh, whatever. It's, uh, uh, when this function accesses that variable, it's going to say input, input, give me your value, which is a reference. So access that reference, go to that spot in memory, Take the state variable and increment it by one. It's actually going to go to that spot in the heap and make that change to the variable that is stored on the heap. Now when I return, that whole stack frame is gone. It's all destroyed. The variable input was destroyed, which stored that reference. But that change that it made is still reflecting in our program, in our uh, main stack frame. So now when I go to data, a completely different variable, say, hey, access your reference. OK, my reference is to this place in memory. Go to that place in memory and access your state variable. That state variable is now 1. Because that change was made on the object on the heap. It wasn't made on anything on the stack. Everything on the stack is temporary. It's going to be destroyed. We did make a copy of that value, the copy of that reference. We'll make copies of ints like we did in the previous example. Make copies of those, put them on the stack in new variables with new values. 